<clears throat> now, I'm going to preach. I know I've been preaching on money for like the last couple of weeks because I just, you know, when you study out one topic, you just sort of break it up. So that's why it's all sort of going together. This will be, this will be the last sermon on money, but this sermon is going to be a bit different because this sermon is going to be more of a, a practical sermon. For those of you who have maybe a higher, like what they say, financial IQ, which is people that you know, know how to invest and know, know a bit about money, this stuff may be really basic for you. But what I, what I found, these are things that I've learned over the years, just you know, how to manage money and just things like that. Things I've learned just from watching things on the internet and stuff like that. And to me, I find it's, these are things that you don't really learn in school. You know, and, and until you actually look into starting a business or you look at investing, you don't really learn these things. <laughs> Um, and and I, I think if you learn it at a younger age, you'll see it's so, you're so much more advantaged if you know this stuff early rather than later. And it's like this stuff, you, 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 you're not taught in school. You're not taught this stuff in school. And a lot of parents don't teach their children this. I wasn't taught this when I was young, and, and I wish I, I had known it when I was younger, you know, because then you know, I could be a better steward of the things that God has given me. And you know, it is a, it is a principle in the Bible to, to, to manage your money well, right? To be a good steward, to not waste what God has given you. Uh, so the, the title of my sermon tonight <coughs> is just to know the state of thy flocks, right? To, to know the state of thy flocks. And it comes from this proverb, Proverbs 27. It says here, um, be, dil be thou diligent <coughs> to know the state of thy flocks. And a lot of people, uh, you know, apply this proverb to sort of say, hey, you, know, you need to know, you need to take care of your finances. You need to be diligent to, to know, you know, when, when, you, when you make money, what are you doing with it? Where is it all going? You know, keeping track of it, spending it wisely, not wasting it, that sort of thing. It says, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well uh, to thy herds. For riches are not forever. Right? So we know that riches not, don't last forever, but at the same time, if you don't manage them, right? if you're not diligent with them, you, you lose them even faster. Right? And, doth, and doth the crown endure to every generation? The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth, showeth itself, and herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing. So obviously in these times when people are more farmers and shepherds and whatnot, you know, they, they would think of their business as you know, like vineyards and farms and, and uh, you know, <laughs> herds and things like that. Like when we, when we look at Job and we look at Abraham as well, you know, it was measured in how much cattle they had and how many farms they had and that sort of thing. <coughs> Which is not too far off today because people, you know, they, they, they invest in, you know, farming stocks and things like that. It says here, And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food and for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of uh, for thy maiden. So we see here that if we take care of our money, if we're wise with what we earn and how we invest it and what we do with it, then we can provide for the people that we're responsible for. Not only will we provide for ourselves so that we're not an unnecessary burden on the church and other people just because we're irresponsible with our money, uh, so we'll provide for ourselves. We'll also provide for those people that are in our care, right? Like we have to provide for our family and our spouse, our children. You know, once our children grow up, uh, we have to also, we have a responsibility to provide for our parents too. You know, if they come across hard times and things like that. And also people that we're responsible for. So we have to know, we have to know the state of our flocks. Now, when you, when you talk about money, right, <coughs> some people have this idea that it's, it's wrong for a Christian to accumulate wealth, right? Now, it's, it's not wrong to, to have wealth, right? We know that there are people, people in the Bible, they had houses, they had, they had wealth, right? Abraham had wealth, Job had wealth. People had wealth, right? So people get this idea, though, that it's wrong for a Christian to accumul accumulate wealth. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you, like, these are the issues. Because money is not evil in and of itself, right? Like, money is a tool that can be used. So when we think about the accumulation of wealth, it's, it's not the accumulation of wealth itself that is wrong, right? It's the, it's there, there are issues surrounding the accumulation of wealth, and this is what makes it right or wrong. Money itself is a tool. It just depends on how, how it's used and whatnot. So three issues I just want to bring to your attention. One is <coughs> when it comes to accumulating wealth, right? One is how are you accumulating wealth, right? Because there's a right and a wrong way to accumulate wealth, isn't there? And we can look here in Proverbs 1 where we can see here, this is how, the, how wicked, uh, wicked people accumulate wealth. They accumulate wealth by sinning and doing uh, wrong things, right? Uh, defrauding people and whatnot. It says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lay privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, 
and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil. So you see how they're doing, the wrong, they're doing it the wrong way. And make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. So you see, there's a, there's a lust there for belongings. That's why they're, they are, they're trying to accumulate wealth, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So people can accumulate. So one thing you've got to think about is how do you accumulate wealth? Right? You've got to do it honestly. You've got to do it the right way. You can't be taking advantage of people. You know, obviously, you can't be sinning. Like, you know, if your job is as, as an assassin or a prostitute, like, these are obviously wrong ways to, to make money because obviously you're sinning by making this money. But other people make money wrong ways as well by you know, corruption you know, with the government or oppression. You know, governments and people in government make money by oppressing people and taking away their freedoms, stealing from them. Right When the government just prints and inflates the money supply, they're stealing from us. Right? Because your, your one dollar is now worth, worth less because they just keep printing more and then they get to spend it first. It goes into the supply. And that's why money, you know, you, know, you have the rate of inflation. That's why prices keep going up. It's because they keep adding money to the money supply and the people that are in charge, like the Re Reserve Bank of Australia and the government that allows this, they're just fleecing us. Right? They're just printing money. They get to spend it. They're stealing from our productivity. So things like that, so theft, inflation, and obviously lies and fraud. Obviously, if you have a business and you're lying to your customers, you do have fraudulent business practices, uh, these, are, these are the wrong ways to make money. So one is, how do you make money? Um, another factor is, why are you accumulating the wealth? And this is really why you know, the, the Bible is talking about the rich and condemning people that are just after money because it's not the, the fact that you're accumulating wealth, it's the reason why are you accumulating wealth, right? So there, there, there are different things to be thought about here. Why, what is the end goal, right? So is the end goal of your wealth accumulation so that you can just take it easy, like the rich fool, right? Take thine ease, you know, eat, drink, and be merry. So you can serve yourself with all that money or are you accumulating wealth because you're being a wise steward of what God has given you. You can be more productive because now you don't have to work 40 hours a week. Now, you, now we've, you've accumulated some wealth, you can give more, you don't have to work as much, you can go soul winning more. There's, there's different reasons why you would uh, want to accumulate wealth because it's a wise investment decision, right? It's just using your money wisely, like we've given pounds and talents and, and what do we do with that? <coughs> So this is what the Bible is talking about when it talks about, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not striving to accumulate this mass of wealth because it's not a self-serving accumulation of this wealth, right? It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, right? So we, we live righteous and we're happy with what we have. Hey, we've already gained a lot. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So this is the right perspective. Even though we can use money as a tool, right? We can accumulate it. We can use it for God's work. Ultimately, it's not coming with us to heaven, right? So it's not what we live for. It's not the reason why. It's just we can utilize this tool. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content, right? So it's, it's content means that you're happy, right? Content doesn't mean that you never desire anything else. A lot of people have the wrong idea of what it means to be content. Content doesn't mean that you don't strive for excellence, that you don't want to do better, right? It's because it's not like content means, okay, well, you know, I, I, I've, I've got a soul winning. I'm just content with my soul winning, right? I'm just content with what I'm doing for God. I'm just content with, you know, how, you know, how many children I have, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> content doesn't mean that you don't desire additional things. Content means that you're happy with what you have. And the real test of contentment is if you don't get that thing you want, are you still happy? Right? So even if you don't get that thing you want, or you lose those things, right? If you lose material possessions, you lose, you, you lose the opportunity, are you still happy? That's the test of contentment. Are you happy with just what you have? But it doesn't mean we don't strive to do the best we can. It says, but they that will be rich. See, so, so the people that want to be rich, Right? Because you can accumulate wealth for yourself, right? Or you can accumulate wealth because you have responsibilities, because you want to give more, right? Because you have, you, you have things you want to accomplish, right? For God. So they that will be rich 
fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, right? So there are dangers for people that become covetous, right? And that's all they want. They want to accumulate wealth for themselves. It says here, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So you see here that it's not money that is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And that's why we talk about, like, it's why do we want this wealth, right? Labor not to be rich. See, so we're not laboring with the end goal that we're rich, right? But we obviously labor to, to, in order to make a living because we have responsibilities and we have things to pay for, right? So it's about how are we going to be productive with the money that we make. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven, right? So riches are not forever. <coughs> so I think there's a difference. So when we talk about accumulating wealth, it's not so that you can serve yourself and you can be rich. It's, what, I'm uh, what I'm comparing the two is, one is wanting to be rich, right just so that you can have it easier and you can enjoy and you can serve yourself more as opposed to accumulating wealth to be more productive right so that you're not always trading time for money but then you can actually do more now if you use your money wisely right um, so things like you know less time working for money you have more time to serve you know more that you can give right so if you're wise with how you use your money you have more to give and more that you can help people with. <clears throat> also, you'll leave an inheritance for your children, right? And the last thing, <clears throat> so this is, I'll just, I'll just show you this. So this is, I already went to the rich fool, so I, I won't really talk about it, but you can see here the, the rich fool, right? So he says, I will say to my soul. So you see how the reason why he's a rich fool is because he, he's stored up all this wealth just to serve himself. To, to my soul, you know, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Right, so there's nothing wrong particularly with accumulating wealth, but why are you accumulating wealth? What is the end goal, right? Are you using it to serve God? Are you using it to be more productive for God? That's the idea. And the last issue is, you know, are you neglecting in order, you know, if you're, if you're pursuing this accumulation of wealth, are you neglecting your duties as a Christian, right? Because somebody might say, well, well, it's not wrong to accumulate wealth. But then if, you're, if that's just all you do 60, 70 hours a week and you're not part of a church where you're encouraging people to, to live the, the daily Christian life, uh, you know, other things that you can, you, know, you can neglect is your, your family. You know, some people, they just spend so much time and, and work and hours accumulating wealth that their, their relationship goes to, to down the toilet, you know, their relationship with their children, you know, they don't spend any time with their family, uh, <coughs> and things like that. So are you neglecting your duties as a Christian? You know, where you don't have time for church, you don't have time for soul winning, right? You need to spend some time soul winning. You, know, you need to do these things so that not only do, do you invest some time into the spiritual, because, you know, yeah, we, we have to think about our future and thinking, hey, we might live to we're 80 or 90, but what if you don't, right? So you always want to be investing a little bit here, but a little bit in heaven as well, making sure that you're investing and laying up treasures in heaven and always putting money in both places because we have a responsibility here and there. Um, let's go to Matthew 6. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So obviously, if you read through this passage, it's not just saying that, therefore, you'll become wealthy. It's just saying, therefore, your needs are going to be met, right? If we put God first and his righteousness. So it's not just, you know, thinking about God. It's also being obedient, right? And doing the things that God wants us to do. All these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, a lot of people try and take Matthew 6 to say that, oh, you know, well, then you, you, don't, you shouldn't be budgeting. You shouldn't be thinking about the future. You shouldn't be putting money away for retirement. and, and Because they, they think that what this means is that God is teaching us to be irresponsible. No, God's not teaching us to be irresponsible. He's just saying that you're not worried about the future. You're not, you're not concerned. You know, if you, if you put God's kingdom first and you work hard and you're wise with your money, you're going to be taken care of, right? You're going to have what you need. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. But that doesn't mean that you're not, you're not responsible, 
right? Like as we know, in, well, we read in Proverbs, there's Proverbs about this, you know, where we, we read about the ant gathering in harvest so that they can provide meat in summer, things like that. So <coughs> I just wanted to make that point because I think some people have this idea that, you know, if, if a Christian accumulates wealth, that's wrong in and of itself. It's not wrong in and of itself. The question is, what are you doing with it? Right? So some people have more financial talent in, in that sense. You know, it's like some people have, they, 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 people have this different talents and different abilities and different ideas, you know, where they, they, they know how to be more productive. But we know to whom much is given, much shall be required. So if you have the ability to create wealth and yet you squander that wealth, you're going to be accountable to God for what you do with the wealth because ultimately God's the one that gave you that power to get wealth. Now, it all starts, right, you know, when it comes to just taking care of yourself and accumulating wealth, it all just starts with working hard, doesn't it? Just, you, just have a, you, work, you work hard and, and, and honest work. And the Bible actually teaches this in Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, we're told servants, so we would think of that today as like an employee, right? Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. See, so when you work your job, even when you run your business, we'll see you later, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So look how many times he repeats, he says, as unto Christ, the servants of Christ, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So most of us here are employees, right? The majority of people are employees. The minority of people are business owners. But what the Bible is saying here is that when you go and work your job for your boss, you ought to be working as though you are working for Jesus Christ, right? You, you, you ought to be working that job as though Jesus is your boss and, and, and not, uh, you, know, uh, you know, mucking around, not being productive, you know, uh, you know being lazy, not doing your job. Um, you know, I, I, guess, I guess the sad thing is today is that, you know, people often do their job harder than they serve Christ. It's like the other way around. It's, it, that's the sad thing because, you know, the Bible's sort of assuming here that you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that you prioritize Him, that you serve Him to the full ability, and that, that, that you should be doing your job to the same standard that you're serving Christ. But unfortunately, we live in a day and age where people, they serve their job and they serve their business more than they serve God. So maybe, you know, we have to switch it around a bit and say, can you serve God in the same way that you serve your job and then go up and then, and then serve your job as you serve Christ? So th that's a sad thing there, that it's, you know, in our day and age, it's the other way around, that people often treat their own things and their own business with more effort than they do the things of God. But it should be the other way around, right? We should be treating God's things in higher regard. We should be doing a good job when we do something for the Lord, when we do something for the body of Christ, and then take that principle, you know, take that ethic to the work environment. So at your work, like you, you as a Christian, you as a child of God, you ought to be known as a hard worker. Like people should be, like you should have a reputation at work. You know, they talk about your brand at work. Your brand at work should be, hey, this guy is diligent. He does a good job. You know, you get him to do something. He does it better than anybody else there. I can trust him. with it. That ought to be your testimony at work. And it's the same with business owners, right? So it's not just employees work as though they're serving God. Business owners the same. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, or who? Their, their employees, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So it's not just the employee works like they're serving Jesus, but also the master, right? The business owner or the manager, they also ought to work as though they are working for Jesus. That's why it's important that people that have businesses, they do it honestly, right? Because they should be serving Jesus. And same with a manager, they shouldn't be oppressing or, uh, you know, uh, not treating their employees or the people that report to them <coughs> badly. <coughs> now, the thing is, right, if you take this principle and, and work hard at your role and excel at your role or your business, you're going to be taken care of. You're, you're, you're going to make money. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not that you're going to be begging on the street because these are the sort of people that employers are looking for. 
You know, like if you're a hard worker at your job, they're not going to get rid of you, right? Because they, then they risk getting somebody that's worse, right? And it's so hard to find an employee that is, that is dependable. And those of you who have businesses, you know that. It's hard to find somebody that you can trust, that you give the, get them to do a task, and they're going to do it well, and you're going to be impressed with what they actually do for you. And if, you, if you're in that position at work, they're not going to make you redundant. They're not going to get rid of you. You're going to get rid of everybody else because you're valuable, right? You, you bring that business value. So one, one is you've got to work your job like you're, you're like, uh, and run your business like you're working for Jesus because you are, right? We, we are ambassadors for Christ. Um, and the sad thing is it's, it's unfortunately the other way around usually where people are working harder for their job than they are for Jesus. Uh, but some of these things, so when you think about excelling at your job, you know, you should be working hard, first of all, but also think about like increasing in skill, increasing in knowledge, right? When you're at your job, you know, like <coughs> when I started at my role, I just started in customer service. But then if you're proactive and you start trying to say, learn the business, learn other parts of the business, teach yourself some skills, instead of wasting all your time playing computer games, hanging out with friends, just having fun all the time. Just use, if you use some of that time just to increase your knowledge and increase, increase your skills, you're gonna be much more valuable at work and you're gonna have no, no issues um, making a living. So you're gonna maximize your value you're going to maximize your hire if you just do your best and, and, and improve your knowledge and your skills. Because you, you, you have to think of yourself. See, mo because most of us are employees, we don't think of ourselves, we don't think like a business owner, right? We don't, we don't, we, and, and, and you, you can tell this when, in, when as an employee, you know, sometimes you, you just like expect your boss to just pay you more. Right? Like, like as an employee, you're just like, I didn't get a raise this year. And it's like, you didn't work hard. In fact, you've been slacking off on the job. Like, you're not, you're not like working hard. You're not, you're not bringing any more value to the company. But every year, you just expect to get a raise. Expect to get a raise every single year. Now, think about it from this point. Let's say you, like, you had to hire somebody to cut your grass at home. Right? And the guy that's coming to cut the grass, he always does like a bad job. He's always missing the corners. Right, he doesn't show up on time. You know, he, you know, he takes longer than he should. Um, you know, he's make, but then every every time he comes, he's expecting more money. So like, he's going to pay me more. You got to pay me. You'd be like, I'm, I'm going to get somebody else, right? I mean, that's just logical, right? You're going to be like, I'm not going to keep paying this guy. It's doing a bad job, or he's just doing the same job. You know, and why should I pay him more when I can get another lawnmower guy who's going to do a better job? You know, for and, and do the things you don't do. I'd rather pay him. So that's why you have to think as an employee, right? You think that when you're an employee, you are a business as an employee. And just like, you know, that, that lawnmower man has to come and win your business, as an employee, you're trying to win your company's business, right? They're your customer. You're selling your services to that business and they're bidding on that business. That's right. That's why you, you have that contract and they agree to pay you however many thousand dollars a year because they're your customer. They're buying a service off you. Now, if you're not bringing any more value to that business, why should you expect a raise? Why should, you, why should you be able to ask for more money when you're not bringing any more value? Because obviously a, a you, as a, as a, if you think of it from a business owner, you're not going to pay somebody who costs you more than they actually bring in, right? Like if, if somebody costs me $100 and then their productivity only gives me $50, why would, you hire, like, why would I hire that person just to lose $50? So this is how business owners think. This is how, this is how corporations think, right? You've got to understand this then you know, you know, you can position yourself when you go and talk to them that, you know, I'm bringing in this much value. You know, you think, got to think of yourself as a business, right? So if you apply these principles, right, if you do your best, you'll do these things, right? <clears throat> because it's the same principle that we do when we, when we serve God, right? When we're soul winning, we don't just keep soul winning with the same knowledge. No, we should be increasing our knowledge. We should be learning the Bible better. We should be getting better at what we do. We're trying to be more productive for the Lord. And if you bring that same work ethic over into your secular jobs and your secular businesses, then you're going to succeed no problem, right? You're always going to have an income. Now, you may not be filthy rich, right? I'm not saying you're going to be the next Steve Jobs or the next Bill Gates or whatever, because those guys get to those positions in other ways. You know, they're like the Proverbs 1 people, right? But, you know, you're, you're going to be taken care of. You know, you're going to, you're not going to have not too little like the guy in Proverbs. You're not going to have not too little, you're not going to have too much, you're going to have enough, right? So it ensures you always have an income, 
right? So you have to have an income to, to put money away, right? If you want to save and whatnot. <coughs> but not only that, not only does it ensure that you'll keep your job, but it means also that you're going to set a good example, right? Like I said, your testimony at work, because people hopefully know that you are a Christian, right? And if they know you're a Christian, they, they better know that you're a hard worker, right? Because you are going to be a reflection of what they think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And, and, and like I said, because we're serving Jesus, it, we ought to strive for excellence in our work because God is worthy, right? God's worthy of our hard work. We should be working as hard as we can for that testimony and for God. So that's where it starts, right? Obviously, it starts with, you know, you, you have to get a job, increase your skills and whatnot, and, and just have an income coming in from, from the labor that you do. <coughs> then it comes to increasing productivity, right? So this is where, you know, if you, if you work smart rather than just working harder, you can actually easily, you know, I guess leverage and, 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 and have money work for you rather than just keep working for money. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this before, right? So this is, this is not a network marketing spiel here because I know a lot of network marketing like use this chart. But... A guy, a guy by the name of Robert Kiyosaki, he kind of made this famous, right? So this, 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 uh, this table, it pretty much goes over the different ways people can make money. And, I, and this is something I wish I had learned earlier, right? Because it's actually, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a lot of like wisdom, right? It's like wisdom in order to know how I can be a good steward. And uh, obviously, when you learn about accumulating wealth from the world, you're always going to get the wrong perspective, right? Because they're going to talk about accumulating wealth and getting rich. So that, why? So that you can serve yourself, right? But that's not why, that's not why we want to be wise stewards, right? We want to be wise stewards so that we can serve God better, right? So we have more time, we have more resources in order to do more things for God, right? And in terms of getting yourself more time as well, right? Because if you're working... 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week for 60 years of your life, 70 years of your life, and you can't stop working, then you're not going to have as much time that you can give to God. Whereas imagine if you, if you were wise with your money so that, you know, if, if you were very productive when you were young, you could retire early, then you could serve God full time. I mean, you could go soul winning full time and not have to worry about these things or do less, you know, work part time and whatnot. You know, and, and, and um, people can benefit from this in the sense that, you know, you see, for example, Kevin. Kevin was very wise with his money. That's why when he started the church in Calandra, he only has to work part-time. So you see how, you know, but if he wasn't wise with his money, right, if he didn't accumulate that wealth, then he, he would have to, he'd be in my situation. Right? That's what I'm saying. I wish I, wish I had learned this earlier so that um, I, 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 I'd done this earlier. So this is what I want to teach you guys so you guys don't make the same mistakes that I have. So the way, the way you understand, I don't know if you guys, who's, who's seen this before? See, that's what I mean. See, you see what I mean? Like, uh, unless you guys are just too shy to put your hands up. But, like, a lot of people don't learn, a lot of people don't learn this stuff. So, so, basically, this is a summary of how you, different ways you can make money, right? And so, e, e stands for an employee, right? So, this is not, I'm not taking credit for this. this is, you can look online. A, a Japanese guy called Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he, he basically made this concept famous. He didn't, he didn't create the concept. He's just summarized it in a way where people can understand it. And, it's, and, it, and I think it's, it's really good to know so you understand how money works. And then, like we said in the beginning, we can, know, we can be diligent, right, to know the state of our flocks. So this stands for, E stands for employee, right? An employee is somebody like all of us, right? That's where it all starts. Everyone starts there as an employee because you, you go get a job. And what you're doing, you're, you're, you're trading time for money. You're basically, you're working 40 hours a week and they pay you a certain check. <clears throat> but it's what they call active income. It means that if you stop working, they stop paying you, right? Like if you, if you get sick off work or you break your leg, you stop working. It's not like the paycheck keep coming in, right? The paycheck stop because you're trading your time for money. So that's why they say as an employee, you have a job. Now, this S stands for self-employed. So when you're self-employed is when you own your own job. You're your own boss, but at the same time, you're, you're like an employee that works for yourself because you're self-employed. If you stop working, then the money, money stop, stops coming in. So it's just like, you know, like, like uh, somebody who's like a photographer. Like we talked about the lawnmower. Somebody does a sale, like a hairdresser. If they stop cutting hair, they stop making money, right? So that's, that's E and S. So these are pretty much the same. It's just that one, you have a job from somebody else, and this one, you, you own a job. So these are what they call active income, where you have to work in order to make that money. 
<coughs> this side is where, where they call you making passive income, right? Passive income is where you could stop working and yet money still comes in. So B, B is a business owner. So a business owner is somebody that owns a system, right? So it's either you have employees working for you, so you employ these people, right? And they're, and they're working for you. And therefore, you know, your business produces enough income to give them, pay them to trade their time for money and then you make a bit more. So you don't work, yet you still make money. So that's, this is why a lot of network marketing companies like use this because they're all trying to focus on this one. But this is not just network marketing. This is people that just own traditional businesses. This is people that um, have no employees, yet they have automated systems working for them. So now we live in a technological age where you can have like an e-commerce store Right? You can have a store online where you, you don't have employees, right? Instead of employees, because they're so expensive and you need insurance and you need to pay them super. You know, now everything's automated now. So you have automated e-commerce where you takes an order, it fulfills it, sends it to a warehouse and sends it out and it's automated. So somebody that set that up and invested you know, a bit of time instead of just being an employee and self-employed has created a business. Now they have some passive income coming in, right? Now this last one, is I stands for an investor, right? So an investor is somebody that it's a, it says it has money works for you. So invest, investments, when you think about it, is when you put money in the bank, you earn interest, you put money in stocks, you can earn uh, capital gains and interest, or you can do real estate, right? A lot of people are in real estate where they, you know, they purchase a house and, and that sort of thing, and then the house pays um, <coughs> rental income. So, the idea is if you're wise with your money, right, and you're wise with how you use your time and your money, the idea is to transition from this side of the grid to this side of the grid slowly, right? So if you're, it's like people who are self-employed, right? They, they maybe start like, like, uh, like my brother, like he started a photography business, right? So he was self-employed, right? Because if he stopped shooting weddings, he stops making money. But then the idea is he's trying to just transition that to this, where now he can grow it to where he's hiring photographers so he doesn't have to work all the time. And you know, he's giving these people a start and yet creating some passive income for himself. So he's, it's, it's wisdom about that. Now, so the issue, so the idea is that you're moving, trying to move from this side to this side, right? To, to, to be wise in how you use your money. Um, and there's different things. I mean, you can obviously. I'm not. I'm not pretend, up here pretending to be some financial guru, right? So I'm just giving you some basics so that you can figure out what works for you and all that sort of stuff. But um, what what I've discovered. This is what this is what I've learned, right? What I've learned is this is what we all do, right? This is where it all starts, and that's sort of like your base. It can start here as well if you have the inclination and the drive to, because th this is obviously more difficult than this, and this could pay a little bit more, but ultimately it's active income because if you stop working, you stop getting paid. <coughs> now, if you move over to a business, <coughs> the problem there is usually it requires like a lot of intellect and it requires a lot of work, right? It, 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 it's people that have that talent or that ability or that vision to be able to know, oh, there's that product that makes money or whatever. And it re sometimes it requires a lot of investment to start that business. So I find that these two, this is quite a lot of work, right? This one has a lot of barriers to entry. But what I've discovered is, is this one, this I for an investor, a lot of people think that that has a lot of barriers to entry. They think, oh, you know, well, if I'm going to invest in money, uh, be an investor, I need a lot of money to get started. But what I realized is that you don't, you actually don't need a lot to get started. I'm going to show you some charts that just will blow your mind. But you know, you can actually start really low. And I mean, all of us hopefully do it already. When you know, when you you might put money away into a savings account or something, and that savings account pays you interest. Um, and I think a lot of people think that, for example, stocks and shares cost a lot of money, which, which they don't always. Um, or some people think, oh, as an investor, you know, I need to purchase real estate or whatnot. So they think that that requires a lot of money to get into, and, and it does. But there are ways where you, know, you, can, you can invest in something like a, a, an index fund where it doesn't require a lot of money to get in and you can start putting away money and earn a higher interest rate than money in the bank. So this is what I'm talking about when it comes to being wise with your money. Let's say you had some money put away and all you've done is you've just, you're just keeping it in your bank account, right? Earning no interest at all. Like that wouldn't make any sense at all. You, you may as well put it into like a savings account and at least get two to 3% interest, 
right? So this is where some people don't know this. Some people just have all this money stashed in their bank account, not making any money for them at all, not investing that. But likewise, people who just put it in the bank and just earn two or three percent, they don't know that it's just as easy to put it into a bank as it is to put it into a fund, right? And that fund's going to pay you five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent interest. And then that money is working for you while it's saved and at least it's growing, right? So this is the idea, to move from this side to this side. So I'll just explain that for you. Now I want to show you this, that a lot of people think, <coughs> and this is more the practical side of the, of the sermon, right? I just want to show you, show you some of these numbers. Because a lot of people think, oh, you know, Victor, you're talking about accumulating wealth. You know, I don't have that much money to save and all that sort of thing. And what I've, what I've learned is it, it doesn't, for the average person, it actually doesn't take that amount of money, that, that much money in order to put some away. And, and, and start accumulating a bit to, to, to start earning some passive income. And this is what's really crazy. I don't know if you've ever played around with a compound interest calculator. See, when you invest money and you earn interest, compound interest is when you earn interest on interest, right? Because let's say the first year you earn 8% you know, interest, and then that 8% interest goes into that account, and then next year you're going to earn 8% on on 8% of the interest that you earn. And then you'll start to see that it has this compounding effect. It grows exponentially because as it grows, it multiplies out more and more and more. But if you've ever played with, with a compound interest calculator, the thing that blew my mind is it's, it's in order to invest some money and be wise with your money, it's not the amount of money that you make or the amount of money that you put away. It's simply just the time that you have, if time is on your side, meaning that you start early, you start young, especially for those of us, for those of you guys who are young in this, in this, in this congregation here, if you start young, it's going to be so much easier for you to have something set aside and have more time to serve God than for somebody that starts a lot later. But just have a look at these numbers. <coughs> now, if you invest in, say, like just an index fund, right, with Vanguard or something, your, your average return is going to be about 8 to 10 percent. And the reason why they know that is because they look at the last 100 years, right, of, of the stock market, and, and it grows on average by 8 to 10 percent. I don't want to go into all the different details about different investments you can make. You can ask me about that later. But <coughs> I want to show you these numbers here because if somebody, th this is what's crazy, right? So this is the first scenario. I'll just show you here. If somebody just put away $300 a month, right? So $300 a month, this is not crazy amounts of money. $300 is like 75 bucks a week, right? That's, that's not a lot of money, right? So three, if, if somebody was able to save $300 a month from what they earn, and let's say on average, you know, the, 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 an index fund will give you 8 to 10%. So let's just be conservative. Let's just say, okay, you get an 8% return just putting it away and, and, not, and not touching it. Now, if somebody did that from age 20 to age 30, so just for 10 years, right? Let's say for 10 years, they put away $300 a month, right? And then they stopped at the age of 30, right? So if you put this into a compound interest calculator, you can see the initial deposit zero, a regular deposit is 300 bucks. They're putting it in monthly, and then they're getting about 8% per annum annually, and they did that for 10 years. So it will show you how much they have at the end of that. They'd have $52,152. Now, this is what's crazy. Now, if, let's say if they st stopped, let's say they just did that for 10 years, from 20 years to 30 years, and they said, you know what, I'm not, you know, now I'm just going to use all my money for myself. I'll use it for something, I'll do, do whatever. And they just left that $52,152 earning interest at 8% and just did nothing more. So we see here the initial deposits, 52,152. They put nothing in. And then we know if, if they just left it till they retired at 65, this would show you how much money they have, right? So if they just put in $300 a month for 10 years from 20 to 30, and then they did nothing all the way up to the age of 65, that's how much they would have in, in that savings, right? They'd had 770,000. Now, if you kept just living off that interest, I mean, most people live off an income of like 50,000, you know, 50, 60,000, and that's pretty much what that would give you. So you see how it doesn't take a lot. It's just, it's just wisdom, right? That's why we have to be diligent to know the state of our flocks, because if we just understand how savings work, it, it doesn't really take that much to, in order to accumulate some wealth and know, you know, hey, we can be more productive for God. 
So, 30, so that's 35 years. He has 771,000 at 65 years old. So that's if you put $300 away a month for 10 years up to 30 and then you did nothing until 65, right? Earning interest at 8%. Now, check this out. Like if somebody does this, if somebody puts $300, let's say somebody starts a bit later, right? They start a bit late, they learn this a bit later in life and they're like, well, I better start putting some money away so that my kids have something, my, you know, my wife's taken care of if I pass away and whatnot. And they say, well, I'm gonna you know, put 300, the same amount away, $300 a month, and, but they started a bit later. They started at 30 years of age. Now, if they put $300 a month away for 35 years, right? So they do it all the way up until the retirement age. They're only going to have $620,000. So if you compare that to somebody who just did that for 10 years and then did nothing, right? That's going to grow to $771,000. But if the person that just started just 10 years later, but then they put away $300 a month for 35 years, they're actually down how much? 150,000 at 65 years. So this is what I mean. I, I, you know, it's, it, when I say, hey, you know, I wish I had learned this earlier, because then if I knew that, if I understood the power of compounding interest, then you know, that would make me put away money earlier and think about you know, using my money wisely rather than just spending it all. Now, you might be thinking, well, Victor, if, if it's that easy, to just accumulate wealth, why doesn't everyone do it? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked because the reason why people don't do it, right? Oh, I just had this last comparison here, which was um, this is if somebody, if that guy from 20 to 65, if they just put away 300 bucks a month, earning 8% interest, they would have you know almost 1.4 million. So you see how it's not the it's not the amount of money you make. You don't have to make a lot of money in order to have an investment when you're older. It's just if you have time on your side and you have the discipline to put it away early. This is, this is what's crazy about it. But why don't people do this, right? If it's so easy, why don't people, it's because people aren't disciplined with their money, right? They're not diligent to know the state of their flocks. They're not wise stewards of what God has given them, and they waste it all, right? And think, think about how people waste it, reasons why people don't save and invest. One is like people don't live modestly, right? People don't live within their means. The Bible says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Right? They just they spend more than they actually make. So they don't have any money to put away. Right? <clears throat> How people do this, people take out credit cards. You know, if you're constantly taking out credit cards and getting into credit card debt. If you look at this, if you see these graphs, you see how this grows exp exponentially. See how it's getting higher as it goes further. If you have credit card debt or you have loans, this is actually working up op the opposite. It's working against you. Right? So rather than you investing money and it growing, if you're borrowing money, that's why it says the borrower is servant to the lender, because if you don't pay it back, your interest is growing exponentially that you have to pay back. That's why you have to, you have to pay off your debts. You have, to, you have to get rid of that credit card debt. You have to have some discipline. So say credit card debt, right? And credit card debts are like 16%, 20% interest. That, that's crazy amount of interest. I mean, if you as an investor could get a return of 16 to 20%, I mean, you're doing really well, right? So credit debt, it's great. I mean, what's another way people waste their money, right? Unnecessary student loans, right? Where you've got a student loan. That student loan's growing. You know, if you haven't paid it back, 3% every year, right? It's growing if you don't pay it off, right? And people go to uni not even knowing what they're going to use, the, what they're gonna use that, that uni degree for. You know, I was the same. You know, you, you go to uni just because everyone gets you to go to uni. But no, that uni degree actually costs you money, right? So they, they've got uni, so they've got the, the student loan. Some people, they're just too lazy to work, right? They're just too lazy to get out there and get a job, actually get some skills where they can create some more income and then put some, some money away and a higher income. What about people that just spend way too much money on you know, parties? You know, your wedding is a good example, right? People just start working and then they spend 10, 15, $20,000 on a wedding. You know, on a really expensive wedding, where you can see now, if you, if I mean, the guy that just saved from 20 to 30, you just had 50,000 in the bank. You just let it grow. It's just going to grow to an investor. You don't almost don't have to do anything more than that. But people don't have that foresight. They don't see the future, right? They don't see. They're not diligent about how they are managing their money. Um, you know, weddings, engagement rings. You know, I'm very clear with you guys. I, I'm not for engagement rings. I think engagement rings are a waste of money. If you guys and I just feel like, you know, ladies that are for engagement rings, 
um, I just feel like you, you know, I'm not being hard on you, but I just feel you bought into the lie that you know diamonds are worth something when they're not worth anything. It's just a, it's just this this market that they've just manipulated to make you think that they're valuable and diamonds are. You can just look at all this stuff up on the internet. You know, you just look up on the internet how they 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 try and manipulate the diamond market to make them desirable, to make them part of like an engagement. And it's like some people spend like five, ten thousand dollars on an engagement ring because supposedly somebody set a rule that you have to spend a third of your income or something, a third of your yearly income, and that's the price. Who made up that rule? The diamond companies made up that rule. It's not, it's not, it's not, not God didn't make up that rule. To buy it. So we don't see engagement rings in the Bible. Anyways, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think engagement rings are a good idea. I think that they're a waste of money. <coughs> what other ways? People getting into a larger house than they need. Right? Buying a larger house than you need or renting a larger house than is actually needed and, and you know, going into debt there. Um, other ways, I'll blow through these, but you know, getting a fancier car than you need. You, know, you take out a car loan just to have that nice car. You know, people say just keeping up with the Joneses because you care about what your car looks like or what other people think your car looks like. I mean, what's the point of wasting this money on, on a fancy car? You know, like I've said before, just like upgrading your tech for no reason, like getting a phone every year just because you want the latest iPhone or the latest Samsung. You're just wasting money, just throwing thousands and thousands of dollars away. Dol money that God has given you to use for His kingdom, and yet you're just using it, just wasting it, right? This is why we have to be wise. Other ways, hobbies, expensive clothing, eating out too much, right? Not buying things in bulk. These are ways that us as believers can be wise with what God has given us. Instead of just eating out all the time because, you know, you're too lazy to figure out how to cook, you know, like figure out how to cook so that you can save some money, you can eat healthier. I mean, buy things in bulk. You know, be wise with it. You know, like you're going you're gonna to use like toilet paper and things like that. Like buy things that you can buy in bulk. Buy in bulk so that you can save some money there. Um, and other things are holidays. You know, a lot of people spend, ho you know, if you spend money on holidays now, that's less money. Like I said, that can be working for you and whatnot. Now, if you're going to put some money away, this is just some more practical wisdom for you. Hopefully, I don't know if you guys are doing this, but I would definitely recommend if you're struggling to save money and be wise with your money, you need to track and budget. I don't know how. Hopefully, I don't know how many of you guys do. I don't want to. I don't want to show of hands, but you need to track and budget, right? And it's the same with people that are trying to lose weight. You know, if, people, if somebody's trying to lose weight, but they're not. They're not journaling what they're eating. That's a bad idea. Why? Because when you journal and you track what you're eating, you're going to be conscious of what you're eating. You're not just going to have this. This. You're not just going to be like, oh yeah, I don't really drink that much sweet drinks. I don't really eat that much candy. I don't really eat that much. But if you actually journaled it, it's like, wow, I'm actually having a you know, liter of Coke with every meal. So that's like three liters a day. And then like over five days, seven days a week, that's like you know, 21 liters of Coke I'm drinking a week. You know, and, and then the money you're putting into that, it's just uh, people with bad habits as well. I found out how, many, how much people spend on cigarettes and that just blew my mind. I had, I had no idea how expensive a pack of cigarettes was. And when the guys at work told me how much they spent on cigarettes, I'm just like, are you ins absolutely insane? It's just so much. It's like $40 a packet or something like that. And they smoke like three packets a day. It's like, oh man, I don't even know how they can spend all that money. It's crazy. So track <laughs> how you spend your money. And this is why the Bible says to know the state of thy flocks. I believe the Bible is giving us wisdom here to actually know where our money goes, right? And that's why we ought to be tracking our money. If you, if, if you are going to save money, then you need to know where it's going, right? And that's why I believe you should track it and, and, and keep track of where all that money is going because then you're going to be more conscious of where that money is going. So there are different programs out there. I used to, I used to just like you know, track all my expenses on an Excel. You know, every time I'd spend money, I'd just like put it in there. And, so, and sometimes I wouldn't buy something just because of the hassle of having to track it, right? Because I'd have to remember and keep the receipt and take it home and then put it into my thing. But, but now there are programs like, uh, I, I use a program called Pocketsmith, right? I'm not an ambassador of a Pocketsmith or anything, but they charge like 99 bucks a year. It's like cloud-based software. But the cool thing about Pocketsmith is that Pocketsmith syncs in 
with your bank account, right? So every time you charge something on your card, all those transactions sink in and they just go into my pockets. And it's the same way I try and keep track of the church's accounts as well. <coughs> well, what you can do in Pocketsmith, so all you, you, you run all your expenses through your card like you normally would, but now you can actually categorize all these expenses. So these are all the transactions going into my bank account, right? And then I can categorize them. So you can see here, this is uh, that? Uh, for the clothing, clothing, equipment, food, uh, you know, internet, supplements, auto, interest, whatever. So green obviously is money coming in and, and gray is money going out. But see, if you do this, if you track your expenses, if you use something like Pocketsmith or you do it manually, then you can create something like this. You can create a budget. Right? You can see exactly how much money you have, whether you have a positive or a negative cash flow. You can start creating plans to pay off debt because you know this is how much money I'm going to spend. This is how I'm going to put it away. I'm going to start paying off that credit card. I'm going to start paying off that loan. I'm going to be starting to put this money away. And then you can use the compound interest calculator to see how much money you can put away. And you can plan. You can be a wise steward, right? And not waste the money that God has given you. So if you know where it's going, then you can create a spreadsheet like this where you can say, hey, well, this is my income that's coming in. These are all my expenses. So I have all my categories here. This is my actual, this is how, um, how much I actually spend. I can set a budget. I know what my positive cash flow is. I know how much I can put away in investments. And then I know what's left over for me, right? So this is where you want to set up things like that and be diligent to know the state of your flock so that you know where your money is going. Now, one piece of wisdom somebody gave me is like you set up these, these automatic payments. So if you use any sort of net bank, you can set up automatic payments, right? So the reason why you do that is so that you have the discipline to not touch that money. So usually you set up your automatic payments either the day you get paid or the day after you get paid, right? So if you get paid on a Monday, that's what I do. I set my automatic payments on Tuesday. So I know that Tuesday, this money flows out to things, to other different accounts or investments, or you know, you put money aside to give to church as well, right? So that's a priority as well. <clears throat> and other things like that. So it's like taxes, you know, when you get paid post-tax, you, you don't have a choice whether to pay tax, right? You don't have a choice whether to put money into your superannuation. It's the same with your budget. If you set up these scheduled payments, these automatic payments, you don't even see that money, then that can give you some discipline to not just spend it on anything, right? Because then you're just using the money that's, that's from your bank account. So I think you should set up automatic, you know, automatic deductions for giving to God, for example, or budgets. If you're saving up for something or trying to pay off a debt, you should have, you know, if you know you need to pay off $100 every fortnight to pay off that credit card, then that should automatically come out so that you don't touch it. You don't end up spending it on a holiday or spending it on clothes or spending it on eating out or spending it on fun and whatnot. We need some discipline. Uh, same with savings. So I know this is more a bit of a practical sermon because I've just been talking about money issues over the last three weeks. But I hope that gives you a bit of information about being a wise steward. And if you haven't never come across this information before, that it just teaches you to be more wise with your money. Because I believe God wants us to be wise with the things he's given us. So just a couple of closing thoughts. So godliness obviously does not just equal poverty and irresponsibility, right? It's not that the poorer you are, the more godly you are, or the more irresponsible you are, the more faith you have. No, no, it's, it's that we, we are given resources that we are as stewards of, and we have to be as wise as possible with that. And sometimes learning this wisdom, know, we can learn how to use our money more wisely. Now, <coughs> like I said, part of being a Christian is being a hard and honest worker. Two, three more points. So manage your money, be wise, you know, increase your productivity. And this is probably the most important. And this is what I want you to go away. I don't want you to go away with this sermon thinking, you know, oh, Victor's just like trying to tell everyone how to be rich and everything like that. No, no, no. I'm, I, my point is here is if you're wise with your money and you're disciplined, then accumulating wealth is, is, is not that complicated. But ultimately, what is the purpose of us accumulating wealth, right? If the purpose of you wanting to accumulate wealth is to serve yourself, that's what the Bible's condemning. But if you're wise with your money because you want to do more for God, that ought to be what drives us, right? To, to be better, to do more work, to be more productive so that we can do more for God. Because we only have so much time on this earth, right? We only have like, you know, 80, 90 years. But if I can be wise with how I spend my time 
and I could make the same amount of money in less time, that means I have more time to give to God. I have more time to serve God. And ultimately, that's the goal. That's why we want to put these things into practice and be wise with our money. All right, I hope you learned something. Let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, um, for giving us what we have. Uh, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd help us to be wise. A lot of these things, Lord, are not taught to us at a young age. <coughs> I pray, Lord, that we would help instill in our children how to be wise with their money, how to put money away um, and have it work for them rather than to work for money their whole life so that they have more to serve God with. And I pray, Lord, that you, know, you would help us to not be covetous, help us to... Um, Help us to keep you first in everything we do, Lord, and help us to have a goal that the reason why we would want to do anything in this world is to serve you, to serve the body of Christ, to help other people, Lord, to be a blessing. Because truly, God, um, you did, uh, Jesus did say it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be wise and uh, Lord, help us to not be caught away with just the pleasures and lusts of this world. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be diligent, to know, and help us to, to, to budget. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be responsible with what you've given us. So we praise you and we thank you and uh, pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.